Good morning. My name is Mandy Galanti from the New Jersey Kick. I will be your moderator for today's event, Achieving Cyber Resilience, Best Practices and Resources for K-12 Schools. We are so glad that you're joining us today. We hope that you will leave today's session with the resources that you need in order to make your school district more cyber resilient. We are very grateful to all our speakers today for sharing their time and information with us. Um, and so let's get started uh, with some resources for you. Um, I believe uh, we can welcome Michael Hastings from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. So, Michael, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks for coming today. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm also here joined uh, two of my colleagues are on the line, uh, John Durkin and Anthony Zissimos. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a overview of our cybersecurity advisor program. Um, and we are here in the area also actually nationally to help our partners build resiliency in their cybersecurity programs, listen, and also to coordinate the resources that CISA has to uh, help your organizations build cybersecurity. Next slide. We cover uh, 12 critical areas in, in critical infrastructure. And one of those, of course, is being in the government and public sector uh, in, uh, you know, to help protect our networks and also our information. But as you can see from the slide, we cover 16 critical sectors on cybersecurity. Next slide, please. Okay. So I'm going to, we're going to talk about some of our cyber resources. Uh, we, break, we break them down into two, basically two components, where from the regional perspective, we have five really products or resources that are available at no cost to your organization. And also uh, from the national level, we also bring other resources that we can uh, provide to, to your organization. And we'll go into a little more detail on these and, and following slides. Next slide, please. Cyber Resilience Review. This one is a real uh, good uh, dive into your organization's operational resiliency. Uh, it's a self-assessment. It takes usually four to five hours to complete. And also, you know, we can assist with this assessment also but it really helps you understand and measure where your capabilities are now as it relates to uh, operational risk and also to uh, organizations that are, are your peers out there um, in, in the nation. Next slide. The, uh, the, the CRR really focuses on 10 areas of uh, key domains. So you can see from here, you know, Look, going from asset management to vulnerability management to risk management. And really, uh, you know, it'll focus on these different areas and how, you know, whether your documentation is in place, whether, uh, you know, notification plans are there, and how does all of these areas, do they align uh, with goals and practices of the organization? Next slide. Okay, the benefits of this, there's three, uh, there's three major benefits. One is you can get comparison data with your peers as to, you know, how your, your organization's cybersecurity posture, uh, you know, measures up to, to your peers and also gives you a snapshot of where your organization stands as related to the NIST cybersecurity framework. And also uh, the, the additional one is options for consideration uh, and different uh, ways that you can improve improve your posture. Next slide. The cybersecurity evaluation tool. This one is really um, one of our popular resources. It takes about two hours to execute, 
Uh, it's also either self-administered or we can work together with you. It's immediately available for download. And where it does is uh, it really goes into your network security practices and it drills down in specific areas and also makes recommendations on uh, you know, where you can improve really the biggest uh, return on your investment. So this, this actually is, uh, is a good one. As you know, the CRR is a little more in depth. If you want to go that way, the CSET is a great way, great way to start for an evaluation of your of your uh, security network. Next slide. External dependencies. This uh, this resource here is really designed to identify, you know, who are your critical vendors and suppliers. Uh, you know, what would happen if there was a you know, if there was a break in supply chain management, um, and if one of your critical vendors was unable to deliver the, you know, deliver their resource, how would that affect you from doing your job? And it could be at the IT level, it could be a cloud provider, it could be a hardware provider, it could be a third party IT as a service vendor. And it really goes into linking, you know, who these critical vendors are, you know, what is the relationship and what are we doing to, you know, manage risk with, with, those, uh, with those relationships and with those vendors. Next slide. Uh, and here go, and here's a little more of what we we're talking about, uh, you know, how do we manage and govern these relationships? I think it's very important that we know who our top level um, vendors and suppliers are and you know what is our plan if for some reason there's a disruption in the service that they're able to provide to us? Right. Cybersecurity infrastructure survey. Uh, so this is one where um, it differs a little bit from the previous uh, the, the previous assessment in that this is a threat-based scenario. So if you can, what you can do is once you um, identify your, you know, your, your capabilities and your infrastructure, you can change different scenarios. Uh, next slide, please. And really, uh, if you look on to the right, you know, once you identify, you know, how your network and your security, security posture is set up, you know, where, if you were going to your to your board or to your budget or doing your planning, where should you invest your cybersecurity dollars? And this will really give you a scenario-based tool where you could adjust changes in your program and you could see where the best return on your investment would be. Um, so this is also a very, uh, very valuable resource for planning and going to your senior leadership or management to make recommendations on, on improving your network security policy. Next slide. Workshops. We, uh, we are available to come out and facilitate workshops with your organization. One is a cyber resilience workshop. Uh, this will you know, introduce cyber resilience co concepts, tie in security operations, business continuity, and the other one that uh, we also are available to assist with is incident management workshop. Uh, you know, do you have an incident management plan? Uh, you know, what is the response? Who should we contact at the federal level for uh, notification, containment, recovery, and really help your help your organization build a uh, an incident management plan or enhance the one that you have. Next slide. From the national perspective, the national resource, we also offer a phishing campaign. And this, this is at no cost, where we will come in at a six week engagement. And also, you know, complexities of the email, phishing emails will go up. But over a six week period, we can really assess, uh, you know, and provide actionable metrics and also highlight where there's room for improvement. Uh, in your organization as far as resisting phishing emails. Next slide, please. 
And here, you know, is an example of, you know, some of the results, uh, week one, week two, how the complexity of the emails go up. Uh, and then you can see the granularity of it. Uh, then we can come back with reports as to how to improve awareness across the organization. Uh, as we know, phishing emails is one of the most effective ways that networks uh, currently are, are being compromised. Next slide. Vulnerability scanning service. If you have a, I see there's a few questions that are popping up and uh, we'll definitely get to those uh, very shortly. Thank you, Brian. Vulnerability scanning service. What we will do is uh, we can scan your public IP address. Uh, this is an ongoing service that starts very quickly. And on a weekly basis, uh, CISA will send you a report that will show uh, you know, what we like, uh, we will show known vulnerabilities, configuration weaknesses that could be out there, and recommendations to close those gaps. And this is something that can continue on. It could be once a month, uh, it could be over a few weeks. So this will give you a really uh, an outside picture of potential vulnerabilities in the public IP space. Next slide. This we also do something very similar for your web application scanning. If you have publicly facing websites, we will also uh, scan your internet facing websites and also identify any potential vulnerabilities or configuration weaknesses and, and provide recommendations on how to, uh, how to close those gaps. Next slide. Remote penetration test. Uh, that's another uh, resource that we have available. Uh, it's you know it's it's non-intrusive. We won't ask for any access, but uh, through you know known methods, uh, we will attempt to uh, you know to access open ports protocols, identify those, and bring those to your attention as you know potential uh, risk that we can that you can use to close up these vulnerabilities and and strengthen your posture. Next slide. Risk and vulnerability assessment. Uh, we can do a uh, basically a penetration test. It could be uh, against a small range of IPs, or it could be against a specific area of your network that you'd like us to test, and also advise if there are any known vulnerabilities that, uh, that are uh, that you can mitigate against. Next question, uh, next slide. Additional cyber resources, uh, next slide. MSISAC, we do have a representative from MSISAC, so we will uh, we'll save that for our next speaker. Next slide. Homeland Security Information Network. There is a trusted platform online that we that we have available for information sharing and collaboration. Next slide. The the federal virtual training environment as a government entity school district. This resource is available to you. Uh, there is excellent cybersecurity training here. You can uh, use it for continuing professional education, train staff or for specific areas that you're looking to build your program in. Um, and we'll also, you know, we'll have the, uh, these ad this address available for reference. But this, uh, this is a great free resource for cybersecurity training that's available. Next slide. Stop, Think, Connect. This is uh, really one of our central websites that brings together many of the resources and uh, products that we've talked about earlier in this presentation. Uh, we'll have this address available also for you for reference. Uh, next slide. And finally, our incident reporting uh, contact. So here is where there's a 24 by 7 contact number. Uh, there's also a, a website where, you know, where, how, and when to report. If there's a suspected cyber attack, 
If you have some sort of lost control of your systems or you suspect a malicious software, uh, here's a number for you to call to contact CISA and we will, uh, you know, we will, we will come in, not, you know, we will provide some resources and uh, do some assistance to mitigate, mitigate some of these issues. Okay. Okay. Michael, that yeah. was amazing. Um, I'm going to do the same thing I did with Marley. I'm going to try and uh, help us work through some of these good questions. And and one that has already come up from two people is there's, uh, uh, I think you listed at least 10 services. Can you give us an idea yeah. of how we find out which ones are free and which one have a cost to the district? Okay, great question. All of the resources that I mentioned in the presentation are at no cost to the district. Uh, they're provided for through, you know, the federal budget and the taxes that everyone pays. So this is a resource available at no cost to to, uh, to our partners out there. That's amazing. That was a lot of resources. Okay. Um, uh, two of our questions have to do with phishing. So if the first one is about phishing simulations. How often do you recommend that those be conducted? How often should I do a phishing simulation? I would say it really, you know, it would depend on, you know, what you measure, you know, what's your measurement of the, you know, the, the risk of phishing email in your organization. If you run a phishing campaign and the numbers are really low because you've been doing, uh, you've been doing awareness in your organization, then, you know, you may want to do one annually. If, you know, some more training or awareness, uh, is there because the numbers are high, then I would recommend doing it a little more often. So really the recommendation is to, yes, run a phishing campaign awareness and then measure uh, you know, what your follow-up steps would be. The most importantly would be having you know, education within the organization. That, that, gets a, that goes a long way with reducing that risk. Yeah, so it's not just a gotcha. We also have to make sure that our users are are well informed, right? So yes, yes. I think every yeah, everybody's going to jump on this fishing campaign assessment. That I, I'm starting some questions. So to do that, um, like, how do they sign up? And is there like a lead time? What could they expect in terms of of that part? You know, getting this happening. Okay, uh, several of the services, uh, you know, have very have pretty quick turnaround times. Uh, the best way to do it would be, uh, you know, my my colleague Anthony here is in the New Jersey area as well. Um, I would say if possible, if you could consolidate the requests or the, the organizations that are interested, email that, that over to us and we'll take it from there. Ooh, okay. That made it sound pretty easy. Um, we, have, we have a repeat of a question that we gave to Marley. What would you recommend, given you know all these assessments that you do, as the top three things for securing workstations? What's your advice on that one? For securing workstations, okay, it's a. I would ask, is this a, um, is this a workstation area, or securing workstations from a cyber attack or a or a, some sort of a threat vector? I think they're talking uh, you know, about one, your basic template for their for their devices that they hand, that they give to to you know all the teachers and staff. So what's that okay. general you okay. know workstation? I think you know one of the most important things, of course, is you know using a strong username and password, changing your passwords regularly. Um, that's that's key. Another one is you know secure your workstations at all times. If you get up to you know get a drink of water, lock your workstation. And then finally, uh, we, we really encourage the use of multi-factor authentication. Are you able to use a smart card? Um, are you able to get a text? You know, if you're accessing an application, there could be, you know, application security. Well, you really want to look at multi-factor, you know, smart cards, strong passwords, uh, and locking your workstations. And then, of course, making sure that you take advantage of patching and updates at, at all times. 
So is there any uh, advice that's different uh, now that we see schools using devices that are Chrome-based or are using cloud-based providers like Google? Um, does that change any of your answers? It, it doesn't really. Um, it doesn't. And along with that, uh, you know, I would definitely encourage, you know, the, the external dependency analysis. You know, you really need to know, you know, who are your key, who are your key providers? If you're using a cloud provider, if you're using a third party IT as a service, you know, who are these organizations? What are their financial strengths? What is their disaster recovery plan? Uh, and you really need to assess them on a risk-based approach. You could go in and find out that they don't have any plan at all, and they're the ones that are backing up your system. Um, and in that case, you would might you want to change change your posture or maybe the way uh, you know you rank your key provider. And that comes back to one of your tools, the EDM, where we look at your vendors and where the risk is there, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, we've got one last question for you, and it's a pretty good one. I'm going to read it exactly. Is it correct to assume that organizations such as the Colonial Pipeline have used these types of assessments, and how is it that they were still vulnerable? How secure can we be in the K-12 environment? It is, uh, it is likely that they have used, uh, you know, programs similar to this. Uh, it really takes ongoing vigilance and constant improvement of your program. Uh, there's no, at this point, you know, there's no magical key to really be 100% secure. But if you follow the security frameworks, you know, the NIST framework, uh, industry best practices, and you practice security and you have awareness in your organization, you can go a long ways to preventing those, these types of attacks. Okay, I actually lied. There's actually one more question. <laughs> they keep coming in, my God. But we're going to go with one more. And, and just for those of you who are asking where we can find these resources, we will be posting a document for you so that you'll have contact information. But the last question is, um, in these um, uh, testings, do you provide executive level documentation or explanations to help sell these trainings to admin? In, in several of the resources that we have, uh, they, do, they do result in a formal report at the end that really that you can bring to senior administration to explain the position and the need to increase budget here or put resources in a certain area. So yes, there is a formal document that is generated that will help you uh, go forward and obtain, hopefully obtain more resources for your security program. Yeah, because it's not easy to get the money to spend. So that's a great answer. And thank you so much, Michael, for bringing this information to us today. Um, it was extremely useful. And uh, thank uh, you. You're very welcome. We're going to get ready to welcome Kyle. But before we do that, we would like to um, run one more poll. Um, Kyle is from MSISAC, Multi-State Information Sharing, and um, the poll already came up to block my thing. I'm sorry. So sharing an analysis center. So we'd like to know before Kyle starts, how many of you um, are already members of MSISAC? Thank you, Mandy. I really appreciate you folks having me. Um, yeah, as a three-way tie, it uh, looks like some of you are sure if you're members, but I will go over that. Uh, some of you know you are members, so thank you. And uh, for those of you who are not, hopefully we can give you some good resources to utilize. So again, thank you for having me. My name is Kyle Bryan. I'm a Senior Program Specialist with the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. I work with all of our members in the state of New Jersey. I have for the last couple of years now, uh, and I'm looking to share with you just some of the no-cost resources that we can provide to public school districts throughout the nation. So for those of you who are not familiar with the ISAC, on the next slide, I'll give you just a little bit of a recap of who we are, what we do, and where we stand today. We started in 2004 as a division of the state of New York. We partnered with a handful of states in the Northeast, as well as Florida and Texas. Don't ask me how Florida and Texas got in there. Uh, I, they were joined into this information sharing coalition because at that time, there really wasn't an avenue to do so for cyber threats. 
didn't take long from the good folks over at the Department of Homeland Security to notice what we were doing, and they actually commissioned us, and they worked with us on a cooperative agreement. That's how we are currently funded today, through a generous cooperative agreement funding through DHS and CIVA to have these resources. After a while, we had to break away from the state of New York to become a truly national organization, and we partnered with the Center for Internet Security, or CIS. Uh, we do love acronyms in this space, and so if I hit 10 in a presentation, I usually get a bonus at the end of the week, so stay tuned on those. CIS, at the time, were working on their benchmarks. They also work on CIS controls, so it was a great match. Uh, in 2011, that's when we continued our great work with DHS, uh, and we were seen as a key resource for threat prevention, protection, response, and recovery. 2018, we took what we were working on with the MSI SAC, and in the middle of a snowstorm, launched the Elections Infrastructure ISAC, which then took the work we were doing and the resources and started molding them for the elections community. And that's where we stand today. A little bit about who we work with on the next slide. A little bit of scope of currently who we serve. We have partnerships with all 50 states. We also partner with all six territories. And currently we have around 11,000 local governments. So who fits into that mold? It's not just your towns and cities. It's not just your counties. It's also folks like yourselves, public K-12 through school districts. We work with now 142 tribal governments, which is very big for us to work with our tribal partners, and all 80 DHS-recognized fusion centers. For those of you who are not familiar with what a fusion center is, that is where all levels of law enforcement can get together to share threat information. Every state has one, some have multiple. For New Jersey in general, we have 272 members, 56 towns and cities, and 75 school districts. So some of you in that uh, one third who do know your members, thank you for being members with us, and probably some of you are unsure. I'm sure you are members with us. Uh, we'd be happy to get you in touch with resources. And I do want to mention we now currently work with over 2,400 K through 12 school districts nationwide. It is our fastest growing sector, month after month after month, working with public K through 12s like yourselves. For those of you who are not members on the next slide, and for those of you who may be unsure, I want to have my cheap plug early of how you can get access to these resources. It takes five minutes to sign up. You go to our website. It is a registration form. You read our terms and conditions. It is a very short read. It is shorter than it is to order a pizza online, have it delivered to your door, and you can be registered for the MSI site membership. If you are already a member and you're just not sure, we'll get in touch with whoever our primary point of contact is on that account and get you aboard. And if you are a member and would like a personal virtual service review, we've been conducting these with our existing members to let them know what they're currently utilizing, what also is available, not only just from us, but other resources from the folks over at DHS, some resources from the folks over at the FBI, to let them know what is out there, what they can utilize at no cost. Contact us at info at msisec.org and we can get something scheduled for you. If you're not a member and you want to register, this would be the next steps afterwards. Someone from the stakeholder engagement team, most likely myself or one of my colleagues, will be in touch with you in about 24 hours with all that great information. So why are we here? On the next slide, we'll show a little bit of why we're here and some of the threats. And this is one of my favorite case studies to bring up for the K-12 through school districts. This is the little town of Duanesburg, New York. It is a town of around 6,000 people. This was a few years back, and this will show for a lot of folks who think, maybe I'm too small. Maybe they're not looking for things from my district. Maybe threat actors aren't going to attack me because I'm just, what do I have? They were hit with Zeus, which is a key logger to steal in, uh, banking information. And if you look at the date on that, they occurred between Friday, December 18th and December 20, or, uh, 22nd. What do you think was going on during that time? Well, everyone was really gearing up for their uh, holiday break. The first transfer occurred on that Friday, and I believe it was somewhere in the range of about $1.2 million transferred overseas. The second time they jumped in, they tried to transfer another, uh, I believe it was another 1.1 million. And then on the third try, it was somewhere around the range of 800,000. When that third transfer did attempt, that's when their bank was able to contact them and say, do you approve of these transfers going overseas? 
And of course, the administration said, of course not. And then I said, what about the other two? Well, what do you mean the other two? An attempted theft of over $3.8 million from a school district of a town of 6,000 people could bring any district to their knees. But utilizing resources that are available, they actually contacted the FBI and their financial fraud kill chain, which is a fantastic resource. If you're not uh, aware of those, I'm sure that uh, your local FBI field office is always available to help you, especially with the monetary loss. They were able to get back $2.5 million out of the attempted threat, uh, theft of $3.8 million. Unfortunately, it was still about one thirtieth of their yearly budget. This goes to show what is a hitting our K-12 school district and the possible scope of what could happen with these threat actors. And that's why we're here. We're here to give you as many resources as possible to help keep these from happening. So now that I've effectively, hopefully, scare some of you and hopefully get you involved with some resources. What do you receive as a member of the NSI SAC? Well, on the next slide, we'll talk about our security operations center. If you are in a situation like Duanesburg, if you're in a situation where you think something's going on in your network, give us a call. 24 by 7, 365, it doesn't matter if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, somebody is available to take your call. 1-866-787-4722 or SOC at cisecurity.org if you're more of an email person. What they'll be doing when they are not taking your call and handling your incidents, they are tracking the latest threats and trends in the state, local, tribal, and territorial government community. Through that cooperative agreement with DHS, they had funded intrusion detection systems for all 50 state governments in the country. We have two sensors on every state network as well as one for every state election network. Uh, we also have hundreds more across the country for folks who have purchased an IDS from us. And what that gives us is a great bird's eye view of what's going on in local governments. All of those threats, all those vulnerabilities, all of those logs that we receive every month from our IDS systems give us great information to turn that into actionable intelligence for all of our members. What they're doing is they're turning those into cyber alerts, advisories, and they're sending out specific notifications for our members with some of our programs. If they see your publicly facing IPs being beaconed out to no malicious sites, we'll be able to let you know, as well as maybe credential dumps, all coming from our security operations center. In the event you have an incident, we have a dedicated cyber incident response team. Again, at that same number, 1-866-787-4722, you can contact us and we can help you with remediation steps. We have close to 11,000 members across the country. If you're seeing something, chances are we have seen it before and we will be able to help. We'll walk you through the remediation step, uh, steps over the phone and help provide you with some forensic analysis in order to give you a detailed report on what happens and uh, give you tips to keep it from happening again. On the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about our IP and domain range monitoring space. I talk about this one quite a bit because a lot of folks will ask me, what is the first thing I can do today to help strengthen our cybersecurity posture. And that is, well, one, sign up the MSI stack if you haven't already, and to send in your publicly facing IPs, domains, and subdomains. We're gonna do a couple of different things with those. One, on the IP side, we have a great partnership with Spamhouse. One of the things they do is they operate a very wide network of sinkholes. If we see your publicly facing IPs speaking out to anything on the Spamhouse network, we are going to let you know right away. On the domain side, as we know, threat actors do love to steal credentials. They love to dump them for sale or just to prove that they can. If we see your credentials being dumped, we have another great partnership with Pastebin, which is a very reputable site. A lot of folks use it to share code, share projects, but a lot of threat actors like to use it to dump credentials or to tease for a sale. If we see them dumped, we will again let you know and help you with those steps to help keep your organization safe. This is a very easy product to sign up for. It is uh, kind of like those old Von Co rotisserie chicken commercials you saw at two in the morning. You just set it and forget it. And once you send in those IPs and domains to us, you're automatically enrolled and there's nothing else that you would need to do on your end unless you make any updates in the future. Now, on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about our MCAP. This is our malicious code analysis platform. I think I'm up to five acronyms now. And this will provide all of our members with a place to submit anything that they deem to be somewhat malicious. This is very similar to some of the services you'd find free online, 
uh, very similar to virus total, but it does have a couple of different distinctions. One, it is only open to MSI SAC members. We do this so that threat actors can't see what you're submitting so they can change their code. We don't want that to happen. We want you to have a secure environment to do so. You will also have an option to be able to send these submissions to our CERT for additional analysis. If you submit something, you can submit documents, web attachments, send URLs. If you get a report and you still need a little bit more reassurance and you need a second set of eyes, click a button, it gets sent to one of our analysts, and they will get a set of human eyes on it, review it, and follow back up with you. If it's hopefully something you don't have to worry about, they'll say, not a problem, thumbs up, have a nice day. And if it is something malicious, they can provide some assistance with creating a ticket to be able to help you through any remediation steps. All of these are no cost. All you have to do is you can either reach out to myself directly and I will get you in touch with the right folks, or you can go to MCAP at CISecurity.org, just have the subject heading account request and someone will follow up with you to get you on that platform. And I wanna talk now about our newest service. This is malicious domain blocking and reporting. Uh, this is something we've been doing for almost a year now. And we have partnered with Akamai Technologies to provide a version of their enterprise threat protection service. How this works on our end is that you would be able to leverage this service through the MSI SAC and receive reportings from our Security Operations Center. Very easy to get started. It's, it will help you block any of those known malicious studies, those known malicious domains that Akamai or the MSI SAC has deemed to be actually malicious or possibly suspected to be malicious. In the K-12 space in general, when we first started this program, we checked in with one state to see just how some of our members were doing. And we saw 38 instances of ransomware being blocked in just a 30-day span uh, within a state. So we knew that within the K-12 space, this is something that could be very valuable. It doesn't take any hardware or software. There's no clients uh, that you would need to install, no do software. It's a simple registration page. And on the next page, I will show you how you can get started with this. Is all you have to do is go to our website and register, mdbr.cisecurity.org. It is a simple registration, and you provide us with your IP ranges. We ask for those so we can relate any blocks to your organization. When a block does occur, your end user will be sent to a safe pre-configured block page that I would be happy to provide you screenshots just for your awareness. And that log would be sent to our SOC for reporting. On Mondays, around midday, you would get a full report that would be based off of the what we've blocked. Uh, usually it's going to be broken down into CNC, malware, or any other potential threat. You'll see the severity, whether it is a high, medium, or low threat level. And you will see a list of your top 10 worst offenders that your organization hit over the past week. All that will be sent to you on Mondays. And we also have a great frequently asked questions page that has a lot of the questions that you may have with this service. Uh, if you have any other additional questions, I'd be happy to answer them. This is still a very new thing for us and for the K through 12 space. But if this is something you're interested in, it is no cost to all public school districts across the country. So register, and we'd be happy to get you involved in this service. I do now want to talk a little bit about some of our written products. I have normally pages upon pages of these written products that are available, but I do want to highlight just a few. One is our situational awareness report. Every month, we, all of our members do get together to have a call, and we go over all of the latest threats and trends we've seen in the last 30 days. We want everyone to have that information so that they know what the kind of threats we're seeing that are out there. We do know that a lot of folks are busy and can't always make those calls. So we roll all that up into a situational awareness report for some light reading. All those will be available usually about a week after the call. We do release our advisories. Uh, those are going to be based on products that are commonly used within local governments. So you're not gonna be seeing some really strange uh, very obscure software that needs a patch. They'll be surrounding around Microsoft, Google, Adobe. We're going to let you know, has it been exploited in the wild? And are there any patches available? If there's not a patch available, we will give you any workarounds and we'll provide you with a patch as soon as one becomes available. I have seen a couple of questions in the chat and I did see from the early poll 
that getting some end user engagement has been an issue. Something we do provide at the MS ISAC is monthly newsletters, and they're written in plain language, making these things relatable to your administrators, to your end users, to help keep cybersecurity front of mind all year long. You'll see that it does come in a docx file, and it will say from the desk of Michael Alperdi, chair of the MS ISAC. Well, what we want you to do with that is we want you to take his name off of it, and we want you to put your name on it. We want you to change the colors. We want you to put your school's logo, and we want you to send it out as if it is yours. We try to keep things topical. The example I have on the screen here is six common elderly scams. Uh, as we do get towards the summer and more people start traveling, uh, we may have summer travel tips around the holidays, safe holiday shopping. We try to keep things relatable, not just in the office, but also out of the office. All of these will come directly to your email. And we did have one of our members win a workplace award a few years back for these. So if you do win an award with any of our newsletters, please let us know. We'll be happy to cheer with you in the background uh, by utilizing our newsletters. And I do want to talk a little bit about some of our newer best practices resources. Uh, something we've been partnering with over with the SANS Institute, as well as for our team at the NCSR, or the Nationwide Cybersecurity Review, is a new policy template guide. Uh, I did see some questions regarding having different disaster recovery plans. If you're looking for policy templates, they are available. We do have them. I am also the co-chair of our Business Resiliency Continuity Working Group that will provide different continuation operation plans, templates. Uh, we do have donated incident response plans that we'd be happy to share. If you're trying to build something up, we don't want you reinventing the wheel. We'd be happy to share those along with you, as well as different cybersecurity resources guides. Uh, and for those who have completed the NCSR, some of you have uh, for the last couple of years now, it has been tied to some DHS grant funding. Uh, we have a new overview with some slick sheets that are available for our members. If you have not taken the nationwide cybersecurity review, let us know because around October, it is a self-assessment that is based off of the NIST framework that can help gauge where you currently stand with your cybersecurity uh, policy in within your organization. And on the last slide, I do wanna talk about one more service that can really help our MSI SAC members and it can give you a great bang for your buck. CIS does sell this product. This is CIS Kit Secure Suite to the private sector, and it does cost tens of thousands of dollars. However, as an MSI SAC member, as a member of the public space, you get it for free. CIS Secure Suite will get you access onto CIS Workbench, and that is where the CIS controls and the CIS benchmarks live. Anyone all across the world can download CIS controls. We're actually releasing version eight next week. So if you're uh, kind of keeping an eye out for that, those, all those resources should be next week, I believe. And then the CIS benchmarks. But we do know in the public space, staffing, you don't have an army of interns to go over pages and pages and pages of controls and benchmarks. So we've created a couple different products. One would be CSAT Pro. This will help track your implementation of the CIS controls uh, all in an automated fashion. And then on the other side, we have SysCAT Pro with a configuration assessment tool with our CIS benchmarks. What SysCAT will do is scan your endpoints to see how much in compliance you currently are with our benchmarks and help create a roadmap for you, like CSAT will for the controls, SysCAT will do for the benchmarks. This will help you deploy changes and have a more hardened system. We do know that a lot of folks do have legacy systems in place and can't always comply with our benchmarks. One of my favorite things about SysCAT is you can make it very individual for your district. You can take benchmarks, you can modify them, you can change them to have a personalized set of benchmarks for you utilizing SysCAT Pro. When you become a member, if you have not uh, gotten an email, we have a great reps for Secure Suite that can help get you started. We also provide great demos every month that will help go over certain pieces of this program because it is pretty robust. We want everyone to have a good starting point if you haven't gotten those emails, you haven't gotten in touch with your Secure Suite rep, please let me know. I will get you in touch with the right person. And if you're not a member and you want to sign up and you want to get access to this, it usually comes about 30 days into your membership. So Secure Suite, if you haven't taken advantage of it yet, please do. It is something great that can really help secure your systems within your districts. I want to wrap here with just a few things. And we'll call it, what can you do the low-hanging fruit 
just a few tips on what you can do to help have a more secure environment. One, that's patch. That is one of the best things you can do is have a very rigorous patching schedule. Utilize our uh, advisories. Make sure you're not running any in, uh, of those uh, software that need those patches. If they do, make sure they get patched. Uh, using the defensive software, making sure your user end users are trained. I did see a lot of questions on that, and I know that is a big thing for a lot of organizations. I know that there's a bunch of stuff out there with over at DHS with the Stop and Connect as great resources that you can utilize. And one resource that uh, I did rediscover is something that I had utilized in the past that is great, and it's through the Federal Trade Commission. They have a bulk ordering platform through the Federal Trade Commission that can provide you with written documents with hard copies of things going well past cyber, but they do have cyber security training for your end users there, and they will ship them right to your door for free. So if you're looking for any hard copies that just ship to your door, go to the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, a lot of talk today about enforcing strong passwords and two-factor two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication. Make sure that you have a policy in place that makes uh, makes sense for your organization and has good policies to have those passwords changed and make sure you're not utilizing the same password over and over again. I do know we all know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who uses the same password for everything. You're just increasing your attack surface. One thing that is very important is make sure you have backups and make sure they're tested because the one time that you don't want to know that you, your backup doesn't work is when you need them. One rule that I like to have is the three, two, one rule. You want to have three copies of any important file. You want to have them in two different media types and you want to have at least one copy off site, have them off site offline because you don't want threat actors to take your backups as well. One more important thing you can do is have a culture where it's okay to ask. Utilize those free phishing engagement softwares uh, that are available. How many times could a potential threat be neutralized if someone picked up the phone and says, yeah, is this real? Uh, do you really want this? And make sure that your end users know that it's okay to contact you, to ask that question, because a lot of threats can be neutralized just by picking up the phone. Because we do know that people want to do a good job and they want to do what's asked of them. And if it just looks a little off, just have them call. And I like to modify number seven. It says share intelligence, but I also like to say build relationships. Give the folks at the FBI a call. They have great resources. Give folks at DHS, call Michael and his team. They have great resources. Work with the MSI SAC and then work with the NJ Kick. They have great resources. There's a lot of things that are out there to share intelligence, share resources, and work with each other. Uh, work with your peers. That is something that we try to foster at the MSI SAC, try to get people in touch with folks across the country and within your own state. Share ideas, share intelligence, and everyone ends up being stronger in the end. And I do want to leave a couple of different phone numbers here towards the end here. Uh, again, our Security Operations Center, 24 by 7, 365. 1-866-787-4722 or SOC at CISecurity.org. Anytime, day or night, even if you have a question, it doesn't have to be an, an incident. If you just want a second set of eyes on something, they're available. They're always happy to help. And then my contact information. Again, I work with everyone in the state of New Jersey as well as the East Coast. Unfortunately, I'm not 24 by 7, but if you give me a call and you send me an email, I would be happy to get in touch with you. I will if I don't know the answer, uh, I am thankfully friends with people who are 10 times smarter than I am, and I will get you that right answer. Uh, so contact me at any time. I will be happy to assist any of you. So thank you very much. Kyle, thank you. I think the running theme today is how much these organizations are willing, able, and ready to help our school districts with their cyber threats. So we have some questions about the tools that you talked about. <clears throat> but before I go to that, there's just one question that's been across the board that we really haven't um, addressed, is we have some independent schools here, some private schools. And you have mentioned no cost. Can you be more specific about whether that is only for public schools or is it for anybody offering education? For our, under our cooperative agreements, we can only work with public schools. However, we do have some of our resources that are available and are publicly available that I would be happy to put you in touch with. 
Uh, it's just not everything that we can just under our current agreements. But if you are a private school and are looking for things like our newsletters, like our advisories, and like our other resources with some of our partners, get in touch with me directly and I will give you as much as we possibly can. Okay, great. Um, okay, the other one that we've got a little bit of a theme going here is MDBR, malicious domain blocking and reporting. See, I took notes. Um, they want to know a little bit more about MDBR. Um, one question is, is the MDBR DNS? And another question just building on that is, how does the MDBR service work with something like Cisco Umbrella, if we already have that in use? Sure. So yes, our MDBR program is DNS based. Uh, how we works is you would sign up on our website and you would switch your primary and secondary DNS to addresses that we would provide. Uh, and it's pretty much that simple. As soon as we start seeing DNS traffic from your district, that's when our reporting would start triggering over to you. If you are currently using services like Cisco Umbrella, fantastic. Uh, it is very similar to Cisco Umbrella. There are a couple of things that you're getting more from Cisco uh, in terms of more individualized reporting and some controls that unfortunately we cannot provide with our no cost resource. But if you're already utilizing Cisco, you are all set and good to go. If you're ever looking to make a change uh, to a no cost service and save some money, give us a call. There we go. So there's a comment that's not really a question, but I'm going to turn it into a question. So um, everybody agrees this is fantastic, but they need to hire about five more people to implement all of this, uh, mm -hmm. especially for a school. And, and these are unique institutions. For a school, is there one of your tools that you feel um, should, if, should be concentrated on? Not just in terms of cost, that's not the only issue. Manpower is the issue too. Yes, uh, in terms of the MSI said, great thing is all of our services are a la carte. So you can implement a little here, a little there. Uh, I kind of have a prioritized list of things that should be done that take very little time, like once sending in your IPs and domains to us. Uh, that's something that can be done very quickly and there's nothing more follow-up that you need to do. Uh, two will be signing up for our MCAP where that's a quick email and then you have to change that and just have that in your back pocket. So if you ever need it, it's there. Uh, in terms of some of the reportings that we receive, uh, those can be, if you don't have the time to implement them, uh, that's when you can contact me and I can walk you through certain things that uh, in terms of your personal situation, uh, I can give you some more guidance into some services that maybe we offer. Um, I also do a lot of uh, talks on other services that are available uh, through other public works like the FBI or through uh, the DHS CISA group. Uh, we can start working on your individual situation for what you need. But definitely take advantage of the low-hanging fruit of things that are just set it and forget it or a quick sign up just as so things you can have in your back pocket. I like that low-hanging fruit slide. I think that was really key. Uh, you mentioned demos. So, and I think you, in, in my notes, it was about CIS Secure Suite, but do you do demos on other of the products that you, do, that you talked about? Will that be showing up in my membership newsletter? In terms of those demos, not uh, not really. We're actually working on some new uh, video products that can go over some of these things. Uh, those should be in the next several months. We should release those. But if you're looking for something specific, uh, I can provide you with a demo, but there's nothing formalized. The Secure Suite demos are something that's recurring scheduled twice a month that we offer. And of course, if you can't make those, they're always happy to provide a recording. So I think we had some interest in the MDBR. I guess that might be something mm -hmm. where we could get some school districts together for a demo on that. Is that a possibility? Sure. Okay, sure. cool. Um, I don't see any more questions for right now, but we may be swinging back to each of our panelists right after uh, Mike Garrity speaks. So thank you for joining us today, Kyle. And um, I think we're going to start Michael Garrity, New Jersey Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Cell, also my boss. Michael, welcome today uh, to wrap up this uh, uh, symposium. Morning. Thanks, Mandy and, and Kyle and Mike and, and Morley. Thank you so much um, for everybody joining. Um, those three speakers were the reason that we created this uh, webinar this morning is all those resources that are available to you for free at no cost. And, and um, the, the, the idea came up a couple of months ago when every week we were on the phone um, with a different school district or a school uh, that had been hit with ransomware or a DDoS attack or some other cybersecurity incident. And it just occurs to us that, you know, while, you know, everybody is really diligent about doing their jobs, they probably don't know about all the help that they can get. And, and I say this 
as the state chief information security officer. I'm responsible for, for securing the executive branch of New Jersey state government, as well as providing services to you and, and the rest of the state of New Jersey. And I will tell you that on a daily basis, we use FBI, CISA, and MSI research. MSISAC resources. They are invaluable to us. Um, all those products that they have, uh, we've had um, CISA do penetration tests. Um, we have them do vulnerability scans of the network. We need all the help that we can get. And I know we can't do this you know, on our own. And I don't think any of you can do this on your own as well. So the real purpose for this is to let you know of these resources, make them available to you. And, and then you guys can, can reach out to us um, either through the NJ Kick, and we tout ourselves as this one-stop shop for cybersecurity information sharing, threat intelligence, best practices, and incident reporting. Doesn't mean that we'll have all the answers. Like Kyle said, we know somebody that does. And that may be the MSI SAC or the FBI or CISA. And if it's not one of them, uh, we'll find somebody that, that, that can help. And that's really our job in, in the NJ Kick is we're a service organization to serve you. And all the resources that we provide as well are at no cost to you. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us that, that you've seen. We're at your beck and call. I, it, it sounds trite, but we're from the government and we're here to help. Um, and that being said, um, we do provide a whole bunch of different services. And, and a lot of them, um, in some cases, overlap with what is provided by MSI SAC, um, CISA, and the FBI. Um, we act as that distribution mechanism for the FBI and CISA and, and even the MSI SAC to distribute their threat intelligence and best practices products and, and, and all that information sharing. So if you're a member of the NJ Kick, you're going to get those through us. And I know we sent out an advisory this morning. There's going to be our weekly bulletin that comes out this afternoon. That bulletin, and you'll see the Garden State threat highlights at the top of the, of the bulletin, that has to do with things that we're seeing in real time, what's happening to us and how it's probably happening to you as well. So these aren't things that we're reading in the newspaper or happening to somebody else. These are attacks against the Garden State Network or organizations within the state of New Jersey. And if they're happening to them, they're probably happening to you. So how do you prevent them from you know, impacting your, your organization or your operations? So um, this past year has been a really challenging year for just about everybody. And I know schools are, are still uh, either fully remote or hybrid mode. There's some that are back in session. Um, but managing that from an IT perspective has been a monumental task. And we realize that you are, are probably understaffed and under-resourced to do that. However, you had to make up operations. And IT operations always comes first, okay? Supporting the business or the mission of the organization, um, whether it's the Colonial Pipeline or, or anybody else, um, it, it's to do what your mission statement is and yours is to educate students. Uh, so in doing that, cybersecurity may take a back seat. What we want you to do is realize that instead of focusing all those resources on the operations aspect of it, let's think about integrating some of these free resources into your IT program. So they, they are an afterthought. They're not uh, burdens on you. And they're not resources that you need to figure out how to get budget for. A lot of resources that we put out there and, and you know, whether it's CISA coming in and doing a, a risk assessment, um, whether it's using the NCSR from the MSI Act, or even, you know, what we did a few years ago is we put together a cybersecurity program risk assessment. And the reason we did that is we wanted to be able to provide a self-assessment to organizations like school districts so that they can go through a set of control objectives for what an IT and a cybersecurity program might have. And in doing so, rather than going to the Board of Ed or, or going to the administrators and the executives within the school system and saying you need resources, you would have a document that would lay out where you've got um, acceptable controls and then where there are gaps 
and then let them use that to help find the resources that you need to fill fill in those gaps. And, and that's the real purpose of that. It's not a very technical um, assessment. It, it's it's written in plain English for the most part. Um, about 289 questions long or control objectives long. Do you have a cybersecurity program? Do you have policies? Is somebody responsible for cybersecurity? So we heard Kyle mention before they had sample policies. We put our policies at the state government level online. Um, anybody can download those. We were actually based on the, the NIST cybersecurity framework in 853. Um, Download those, change state government to whatever your school district is if you want, pick and choose what you want. They are public documents for people to use and, and people to implement. Obviously not having, not just having policies, but actually following them is, is, and, and standards is, is really what we want people to do. So we've got you know, the, the, the cybersecurity program risk assessment just send us an email and, and you'll see our contact information. And obviously um, after this on the events page, all, all the, the recordings of, of all the speakers um, and the information and the resources that we have uh, will be put up there. Um, we do something and we started this last year and it's about a year old in, in May, uh, which is the You Have Been Pawned um, notification service. And you have been pawned, and I think you know some of you may be familiar with I have been pawned website. You can go there, you can put your email address in there, and you can find if your email and, and password were part of a data breach. Well, we know that we do that for our own personal email accounts, but we don't necessarily do that for our organization accounts, so educational system accounts. So what we started last year was to start scraping all those you know, compromised credentials for K through 12 uh, school systems in New Jersey, for all the municipalities and counties, state government organizations. And because COVID was so big, all the healthcare organizations in New Jersey and all the law enforcement organizations. We've heard about password reuse and that happens all the time. It is common, it, human nature to reuse the same password because you can't remember different passwords for every different service that you use online. There's just too many of them. So what we've been doing with the You Have Been Pawned is, is when we find compromised credentials for your school district uh, email accounts, we're sending them to the school. Your job is to notify those individuals, obviously, if they're, they're um, uh, credentials that allow them to log into your school district systems, we want you to disable the account, have the, you know, the passwords change and those types of things. We find as one of the number one threat vectors that compromised credentials are used all the time uh, to carry out attacks. And so we, we talked about um, social engineering and phishing emails before. Um, same thing with compromised credentials. It's a lot easier to hack a person especially a naive person um, than it is to hack a, a computer system. So getting somebody to divulge information, getting somebody to click on a link, getting somebody to download a document um, or, or an attachment to an email, that's pretty easy to do. Um, we were talking about phishing simulation before. Obviously, CISA provides that and, and some of our other organizations, and, and we do this here you know, for state government as well. But be careful with phishing simulations. They are not to be used as a gotcha. They're, be, they're to be used as a you know, awareness and training platform. And I guarantee you that I could get everybody in, in the school systems to click on a link if I sent an email coming up and saying, due to COVID and, and remote learning, um, everybody is going to go to school during the summer and teachers are gonna require it back. Um, if you wanna opt out of this, please click on this link. And I guarantee you, everybody would click on the link because it, it would cause mass panic in the schools. You don't wanna do those types of things. There, there are really abusive types of, of uh, phishing simulations. It's really to train people on what to look for um, in a phishing email, in a suspect email, and you know what they're getting and those types of things rather than you know punishing people. Um, Kyle had something about de developing a culture of, of cybersecurity. And, and within that culture, and, and we do this here in the NJ Kick, there's a no fault culture, okay? When somebody makes a mistake, it's not a, an opportunity to blame them. It's an opportunity to learn. Um, and, 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 I, and I laugh because just this week, we, we created a project that we call it the Baby Bird Project. 
Um, and if you think of a baby bird and you know in a nest, the first time they try and fly, they probably fall on their heads. Well, that's what we're doing because we're moving into areas that we haven't gone into. And we know we're gonna make mistakes and we expect to make mistakes. Same thing with the education system, same thing with trying to ride a bike for the first time, trying to walk you know, as, as a baby, um, you're gonna fall down. You're gonna, you're gonna fall on your face a few times. So let's use these as learnings, okay? And, and instead, um, creating that culture of no fault and, and so that you can get better the next time. Um, I, I think that's really important. Some of the other products that we have um, and other services that we provide, obviously I mentioned the bulletin, the alerts, the advisories, those types of things, best practices. And, and um, I go back to the, you have been pawned. We, we've sent out almost 14,000 notifications to K through 12 um, organizations about compromised credentials. Your email um, domain with somebody with you know the compromised credentials. So um, we're going to continue that. Um, and K through 12 just happens to lead the league in the number of notifications that that we're doing today. Um, I, you know, we mentioned threat vectors, and and one of the things that you you all said in in your poll earlier was that security awareness training was a big issue. Um, we do security awareness training in the state of New Jersey um, for all state employees. That might be a required you know thing for everybody within um, your your school districts. One of the things that I told my staff is that we want to be able to put together a, a free, no cost security awareness training program that anybody in the state can use. Um, we do subscribe to various security awareness training products, and and um, when I speak to people in state government, they say they just dread having to take it. It's the most boring training that they have. And we wanna do something that is a little better and a little bit more targeted to individuals so that um, we get the message across, um, but also make it so it's real rather than just very generic and very bland. Um, and I think we can do something better because we have that knowledge of what's going on and what's real. So we've got all those things. I'm gonna fill in some gaps of, of, of some things that were talked about and some of the um, questions that, that were mentioned. Um, the K12 and state.nj.us um, domains and a .gov domain. So what's the difference? Um, the .gov, and, and one of the things, and CISA has just taken this over, this is a service that they're gonna provide, is they'll be able to provide .gov domain names, top level domains for free. One reason for that is because, as Marley said, you have to prove that you're a government organization in order to get a top level .gov domain. And what that means is that it's trusted. If there's one thing that the, the public should depend on when dealing with, with government, it's that they're dealing with a trusted organization. A .us domain, anybody can create one of those. In fact, they're one of the cheapest that you can get on GoDaddy or any registrar. Um, and that's one reason a lot of municipalities have used it. A lot of school systems have used it in the past is because it was, you know, very low cost where, you know, just, you know, before CISA announced their free .gov domains, it was $400 to register .gov and about $125 a year. So that put off a lot of municipalities, a lot of government organizations, including school districts from getting those. I would recommend getting a .gov and, and also implement um, you know, secure protocols, HTTPS for everything on your website. There should be no clear text stuff that goes across. You may have somebody that's, you know, sitting in a cafe that wants to visit your school's website and they want to get information, you know, about special ed programs. Well, not everybody in that cafe should be able to see their, you know, their, their request to the school district um, going over HTTP. So using HTTPS is, is really a best practice and it should be used for on every website, whether you're, you're, you're doing you know, credit card transactions or secure logins, or whether it's just general information uh, about your, your programs and, and the like. So this week has been an interesting week as far as um, cybersecurity is concerned. We saw that um, Colonial Pipeline obviously had a ransomware attack. They're not the only one. And, and there's been some questions, how could you know, a big pipeline like that get hit with ransomware? Doing cybersecurity is really hard. 
it's really easy to tell somebody how to do cybersecurity, but there are so many va variables involved in it, especially when we're dealing with people. And I always liken it to, to complex theory and, and, and if you're into math and those types of things. But you know, we, we've got um, lots of roads and, and the Department of Transportation, all sorts of engineers have put all sorts of roads up, traffic control devices um, to make sure that traffic travels smoothly you know, across all the highways and stuff like that. But if you've driven in New Jersey, you know you're going to get stuck in a traffic jam. And the reason for that is you've got hundreds, if not thousands of people on the road with you that make it a very complex problem rather than what's a, a complicated or a simple problem. And it's the same thing with cybersecurity, where you're dealing with lots of variables. It's not easy to do. Um, so rather than us pointing fingers at other organizations that are, are, um, are hit with a, a ransomware incident, say they should have done this or they should have done that, um, take whatever they didn't do or, or you know, the information that comes out of it and use it, you know, again, as a learning experience. What can we do better and how can we do these things ourselves? So with that being said, I'm going to close up um, and, and any questions anybody has, um, please don't hesitate to, to let me know and let us know. Um, one of the things that I'm gonna end with is, and, and I mentioned this to my staff uh, earlier this morning, is there's 600 or so school districts in New Jersey. There, there's an unbelievable number of them. And, and there's very few people um, that are charged with doing cybersecurity. We wanna help. We're going to start a, a school district, school system, cybersecurity working group. We're going to invite some of you to join that working group. We want to understand those problems firsthand. We're going to go out to some of the school districts and school systems to see how you're doing things. It's very easy for me to stand here in my office and say, this is what you should do. But it would be better if we can understand what some of those problems are firsthand so that we can provide better services. And not that we can do everything ourselves. Again, our partners at MSI SAC, at CISA, at, at you know, FBI and other organizations. Again, we're here to help. Uh, we are a service organization and please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So with that, I'll turn it back to Mandy. Okay, great. Um, so we're getting close to the end, but I know there's still some questions. Um, Mike, I'm going to start with one that um, opened up almost at the beginning of your talk, and that's about denial of service resources. They pointed out that they're paying for DDoS protection, but are there any resources that you are aware of that are at no cost? So I, some of them are, are the way that you're going to configure your network. And, and I, I, I wrote an article, and it's up on our website, and, and we can put the link in, in the events page, on mitigating uh, DDoS uh, risk. And, and some of the things, and we, we've been um, attacked. We've had DDoS attacks here, 100 gigabits per second um, over a sustained period of time. And we, we looked at it we were allowing traffic into our network that we should have never allowed in. So we, I don't want to get technical here, but UDP traffic, NTP, um, those types of things. And, and we really had to look and say, why does our firewall need to block those things? Because the firewalls were being overrun. And so what we did is, is we went up to the router level and we started dropping that stuff. And, and you may not have a router in front of your firewalls, but one of the things that you can do is work with your internet service provider and say, we do not need to receive UTP type traffic, whether it be NTP, amplification, you know, uh, DDoS attacks or, or any of those things. And so I would suggest, uh, and, and we'll put more information up on our website about this, about some of these things that you could do when you publicize services, okay, through your firewalls, you should only allow into your network what you're actually serving. So uh, we'll put some more information on, on the website about that and, and hopefully that will help. But yeah, we have, um, we've got various levels of, of um, DDoS mitigation services. So in front of our websites, we've got a cloud-based DDoS um, web application firewall. Um, but we also have, you know, all the other um, types of, of DDoS mitigation services for all the other protocols coming into our network as well. And we can talk through those and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure we get more resources up there for that. 
One of the things that, and Mandy, I'm just going to follow up on this, and we see this with schools. There are um, out there the stress testing or booster type services that you can sign up for. So, you know, when I went to school, if you wanted to get out of exams, um, somebody may pull the fire alarm or, you know, call in a bomb threat and stuff like that. Today, you can simply go to a website and you can sign up for free for a booster service, which will direct a DDoS attack out against your school district's IP address space. Um, so some of the things that you want to look at is, are people on your network visiting those sites? And, and now you've got a suspect. Um, but also be aware of those types of sites. You, you, you obviously can't block um, DDoS attacks that are coming from everywhere. Um, but be aware that these are threat vectors. And, and those resources for those kids that want to get out of exams are also free, depending on how long um, sustained the DDoS attack is and, and how much bandwidth they want to, um, you know, uh, over, overcome. I think, you know, that's the first time we've mentioned today that schools deal with an under 18 crowd, right? And they have their own, they have their own very specific and unique user habits. Um, getting out of exams is definitely one of them. Um, okay, so you mentioned a working group, and we have a question about how, how we sign up for that, please. So we'll, we'll probably um, reach out to you and, and send you an email if, if you want to be interested in it. And if you want to preemptively send us an email and say you want to be interested, um, just, just send me an email or, or send the NJ Kick an email. Um, we don't want to keep, we don't want to make it too big because the, the bigger it is, the less will get done. Um, but I, I know there are some people that would be interested in, in being part of it. And there are some people that I'm going to coax into being part of it because they, they've been great partners with us, um, you know, here in the NJ Kick. And, and they've got some mad skills, if you will, on, on the cybersecurity front. So we've got a couple questions about presentations and trainings. Um, so just to be clear, are in-person trainings, presentations, conferences going to be on the horizon? Yeah, so um, great question. And as the state opens up, obviously, you know, with COVID restrictions, we'll follow those guidelines as far as doing in-person trainings. Obviously, the reason we're doing this on a Zoom session is because we can get more people, you know, to attend um, remotely at this time. Um, but we do have our analysts and, and myself and others that go around to school districts and do in-person uh, presentations. So if your school is back in session and, and you're doing in-person um, trainings again, or, or you want to host one of those, simply go to our website. You can find the resources, request, request a presentation or a training, and we'll come out and do those for you, um, as, you know, as schools open up and, and you guys get back in session. Okay, so here we've got two questions, but I'm going to separate them because because they're kind of in depth. So the first one is about is there a resource where we can read after action reviews for security incidents. It's common to hear that an incident occurred, but rarely is there anonymized information about the response and mitigation we hear about what happened we don't hear about how it was mitigated. Is there a resource that would help us enable from others experience. I, I don't know the, the the answer off the top of my head, and and a lot of times, like you said, there's there's not a lot of information after the fact of, of how it was handled and and how you work through those. Um, we we did just put on a training this week with SANS on on hacker techniques, and 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 a lot of that was how hackers hack in, and you learn how to do that, but you also learn how to you know defend against it. And a lot of the trainings that SANS puts on and others put on are the result of those after action reports and what did happen. It's, you know, it's, it's real world events and stuff like that, although it may not be publicized. And, 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 and I say that because, you know, when I, I look at, you know, let's say the colonial pipeline um, in the last week, how did they get in and, and um, you know, what was their threat vector? Same thing with the Washington DC police department. They got hit with ransomware. Um, same thing with the city of Tulsa. They got hit with ransomware and then the Illinois attorney general's office. And, and so, you know, for, as a cybersecurity professional, one of the things that I'm always asking is what was the threat vector? How would we have blocked it? Um, but, you know, there's the other part of it is how to prevent it. 
you can't prevent everything. And so you're going to need to have an incident response plan to respond to these things. Um, but we also you know, talk about the continuity of operations plans. And you know, with, with Colonial Pipeline, for instance, they couldn't deliver gasoline through their pipeline, but gasoline could be delivered through tanker trucks and trains and, and barges and stuff. So they maintain continuity of operations. Last year, we had the presidential election, um, and we've been doing election security for the last five years or so now. Um, and we work with each of the counties and the state on continuity of operations plans in the event that they had you know, technical issues that would you know, prevent them from carrying out you know, and administering the elections. So making sure you have another pathway to carry out your operations is, is super important. And, and those are the lessons that you can learn when, when you see that you can't provide services, you've got to shut down a school because you've been the victim of a, a DDoS attack. How else can you provide those educational services to your community? And we know schools have already been heroes in that um, in responding to the pandemic. But be, beyond that crisis, we still have a lot to, to be careful about. OK, another question. Same sort of theme. I've been listening to educational podcasts where staff would come forward to share their ransomware attack experience. It helps provide us with insight on what to look for and what to implement. I think this is very school specific information. Is there a way the community could share more information with us so we can learn from others and from each other? And so President Biden put out an executive order yesterday, um, last night. Um, and, and part of that executive order was about sharing information. And, and um, I say this all the time in the NJ kick, our job is to share information. We should be able to provide it. Sometimes we, we overclassify information and as a result, everything's a mystery. Um, however, the more information we can share, the better off we're all gonna be as far as prevention. Um, so, you know, everything we provide in our bulletin is something that we've seen um, or something that has happened in the state of New Jersey. We may not point out, and, and we will never point out unless it's public information, um, you know, who the victim is, uh, but we will put the lessons learned, the techniques, the tactics, and the, the protocols in there so that others can learn from them. Um, okay, so talking about that SANS trainings that are periodically offered, is it possible to schedule some of them during July, early August? It's almost impossible to take dedicated time for training during the school year. Um, let, let me find out about that. Um, I, I know we want to continue to offer them. Sometimes we're at the mercy of SANS and when their instructors are available. So we, we not only have the availability of the, the attendees, but we also have the availability of, of the uh, teachers and instructors. Okay. So we want to go back to that, the popular question, um, and this is getting close to wrapping up here, but what are the top three items that you would recommend in your list for securing uh, devices and workstations? So configuration management. Kyle touched on this with his CSET and, and the, the, the benchmarks. Um, and, and we are users, it's written into our statewide information security manual that you will follow the CIS benchmarks in order to configure endpoints. And, and we see this all the time. Those that have, um, you know, that, that are configured just by click, 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 you know, with the next button, rather than those that are hardened. So configuration management is really important. Marley mentioned um, limiting, you know, who has, you know, uh, privilege credentials. So uh, domain or, or local administrator accounts and, and restrict those. Um, and then the third thing that I would say is an EDR solution, endpoint detection recovery solution that is centrally managed, not something that just pops up an alert on an endpoint and they say, okay, and go on to the next thing when they've got viruses or malware running around, but something where you have total visibility into those endpoints. And, and um, I would say those three, configuration management, um, a, a account 
management and, and then um, the endpoint detection and response tool. And when I say EDR, a lot of those include a lot of um, other things besides antivirus or any malware. They tell you what the configuration is. They tell you what accounts are on those systems, how old the passwords are and, and those types of things. Um, but they also tell you all the vulnerabilities that haven't been patched and all the patches that exist. So those EDR tools are, are, are really important. That was our last question for today, but I just want to share with everybody that this has been a very active group of attendees. They're already starting to take some of these ideas and ask for trainings. We've got a request for an, a New Jersey ISAC Secure Suite demo. We heard from NJECC asking to partner. So that's great that the enthusiasm was brought today. And I think that's because we had such great speakers. And so I'd like to take a minute to thank Kyle Bryans, Michael Hastings, Marlon Mukai, and Michael Garrity for being here today to share these important resources. We did record this event today and it will be available on our website at the symposium event link. We will also be gathering up all of the resources from the PowerPoint points and also even from those you contributed in our chat and we'll have those in one document that you can download and we look forward to hearing your questions and your interest in future presentations thank you so much for coming today it was uh, a, a privilege to try and make a difference to cyber resilience in our schools <laughs>